This episode was made possible by Wix, and we'll tell you more about them later in the episode. It's a stainless steel container that has plutonium oxide, so hopefully that stuff will see its way onto some spacecraft in the mid-2020 time frame. Brady has been to a really amazing lab where they're synthesizing plutonium, and they're making the plutonium to power spacecraft. Spacecraft that go to really distant places, far too far from the sun to use solar cells. So they need to use plutonium-238, which can generate heat through its radioactive decay and power the spacecraft. The plutonium is made from neptunium. The technical problem that has to be solved is that the neptunium is supplied to the Oak Ridge lab as a solution. Okay. So this is where we convert the neptunium liquid solution. It's in a nitric acid solution. And we convert it to a solid. That's a low concentration of neptunium in that. It gets to be a really, really dark green whenever it's very concentrated. We'll put it into this unit, pump it through a, essentially a rotary kiln that's in the other glove box on the other side. And that converts the neptunium liquid solution to an oxide powder. This is the automated pellet press right here. It's gonna first clean this dye out. It has to be really, really clean before we use it. Now it gets a little bit of lubricant and it'll come over and it'll sit in the center of the glove box waiting for that solution to dry. So it's just gonna sit there for about 45 seconds or so. Yeah, there you go. It sets the funnel down. It's going to go pick up a vial. So what, what's the, in the vial that's picked up? That's neptunium oxide mixed with aluminum powder. Now it takes off the cap. Now it's going to dump down the powder into the funnel. Now it's going to replace the cap on the vial. And in a second, it'll take the vial back and put it back in, into the position that it pulled it out of. Now, occasionally, there's a little bit of powder that's left in the uh, top of the funnel. So it's going to pick up a little tool and brush the powder into the dye. That fat part of the unit is what we call the dye. And then the punch is on top. And you'll see it put a punch into place shortly. It's going to come over and get rid of the funnel first. Punch is going to go sit inside. Now it's going to pick up the whole unit and go put it underneath the press. And that will start pressing and now it will start the same operation again for another die and punch set. When you sit here looking at this powder and what's being done here and knowing that some of this stuff's going to end up in space, is that pretty cool? It's pretty cool, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh, pretty cool to be able to be part of the space program and be able to be contributing material and knowing that this material will be used for decades to come. The automated process almost seems very human, doesn't it? Like giving something a little shake and a little tap and the little habits that one might do in a lab. It's amazing. Well, I think the reason why the robot has been made to mimic a human is because we know what a human would do and we know what works. If you were trying to do some really sophisticated new process, you'd have to do endless experiments to see whether it works or not. But we know that a little brush of the funnel or tap is going to work. So it's easier to automate that than to reinvent some new process. So we get a 52 press pellets and it's in a little transfer device we call a boat. And that boat comes over and it sits in the center of this unit. Are they the actual pellets? Those are actual pellets. Yep. That's got the neptunium in it. We got four lasers that actually measure diameter in two different points on the pellet. Now it's just searching for the center of that pellet. Just a vacuum device to pick that up. It's measured the diameters. Now it goes, sets it down. Now it's going to measure the length. Yep. It's, it's been approved. approved. So now it puts it in that cassette. The pellets get put down into these little holes, and there's 53 holes around the perimeter on the, both the inside and the outside. That holds enough pellets for one target. We unload those next door, and we just drop the pellets down into the target. That's the whole process of building a target. So for us, the big deal with, that we have here is the fact that we're going from making about 40 to 50 targets a year to making it at least 200 a year, and, and, and then eventually we'll get another line 
on the other side of the room and we'll be making around 400 pellet targets a year in order to make the production we need for, for to supply NASA. They want more and more and actually we think that going into the latter part of the next decade we'll probably be asked to increase our production. But that's something that we, we talk to NASA about on a routine basis. So it's, it's, a, it's a program where you've got to plan for the next 10 years. You can't just plan what you're going to do tomorrow because by that time it's too late. You can't do anything about it. Okay, now we're going to, what we call is the control room. This is where we have heavily shielded hot cells. And that's how we work on the um, irradiated target safely so that we can safely make the plutonium and give that, again, give it to NASA. After your aluminium and Neptunian oxide spends its 50 days baking in neutrons, you've right. made a whole bunch of new plutonium. Yes. But you've also made a lot of other a stuff lot of you don't want. stuff we don't want. Yeah, a lot of fission products. And this we, is where you do the chemistry. This is, yeah, this is where we do the chemistry. The radiation dose is just too high to handle in anything but a heavily shielded hot cell. This is four and a half feet of shielding. It's a combination of lead glass and mineral oil. Lead glass to shield from the gamma's intense gamma source, and the mineral oil is used to shield for neutrons. So there's like, so there's like oil there, like yeah, yeah, between oil, us. Like, yeah. Like it's liquid. Yeah. So but if like I punched a hole in that, which I can't do, a yeah. whole bunch of oil would go A bunch go of like... oil would come out, yeah. Right. Yeah. All this equipment in here is used for the for processing, chemical processing. We have a dissolver. The top of it is in the floor of that cubicle. And you see all the pipes coming off of it. So that's what we call a dissolver. There's actually a, an opening that's about, say, four to five inches in diameter that we take our targets and those are lowered into the dissolver. We'll do about 20 or 30 targets at a time and dissolve the aluminum using a uh, sodium hydroxide solution. And then once we've dissolved all the aluminum, we decant that, get rid of all the liquid waste, and then we come back and hit the actinides with concentrated nitric acid. Concentrated nitric acid will dissolve the actinides and that allows us to start doing the chemical processing to separate the plutonium and the neptunium from the fission products. Have we got some targets in there that we could take a look at? Yep. So I yeah. love watching these guys do this, yeah. it's like superpower. Yeah, so what we've got over there is some targets that we use during our experimental program. That's an actual target that we use. If we were planning on processing it, we'd cut off the top and the bottom because the uh, top four inches and the bottom four inches are just aluminum. And what we want is the uh, neptunium oxide and plutonium oxide that's in the center of that target. So we'd actually cut Cut off the top and bottom and then put about 20 to 30 targets inside the dissolver and then pump the liquid sodium hydroxide in to start the dissolution process. So each one of those targets is going to give us just under 4 grams of plutonium oxide as a product. We have to run through around 400 of those a year in order to make enough material. One thing that's kind of cool about the Neptunium plutonium is they'll turn certain colors. So if you see a, a color exiting to, in the right way, you're pretty confident that it's working right. So if you see dark green going out, your neptunium's going out. If you see kind of a purplish or magenta color coming this other way, you've got your plutonium. So it's, you can visually kind of see what's going on, which is kind of cool. Then we have a lot of ways we actually measure those concentrations to get very precise results. What do you think when you see these people that have to work with something that's just so dangerous? Like, does it give you chills? Well, I find it exciting. Of course, Although the material is dangerous, it's so well protected, or they're well protected from then, it isn't dangerous, but you always wonder what would go wrong. And I think it's a really good lesson to us chemists about how you can do really quite dangerous experiments if you take the right precautions and have the right equipment. Accidents happen in chemistry when you use the wrong equipment or you don't take precautions. Can you run the arms, Bob, or you, you haven't got... I have, no. Um, did you used to do it, or is it never... I never, been... never, never tried. I, I, my first chemistry experiment in a lab, I, we were doing a uh, very complex separation, and I had it in a little bottle, and then as I was moving around, I dumped the bottle on the ground and had to try to sweep it all up, and I didn't get a very high grade on that, ta that, that experiment, no. That was not... Yeah, I, just, I leave it to the experts, yeah. I can't believe how like gentle you can be with that thing. <laughs>
It's a stainless steel container that has plutonium oxide made in what we call our Campaign 3, which we did last spring. And so this material is going to be held in self until we get the capability to be able to ship it out to Los Alamos. So hopefully that stuff will see its way onto some spacecraft in the mid-2020 time frame. I really liked how our guide was so excited and pleased that he was participating, albeit indirectly, in a space mission. And I think it really demonstrates how even in really weird technological events like spacecraft going to Pluto, underneath and backing it all is a chemist. Yeah. <laughs> cool. This video was supported by Wix, which also happens to be who we've used to make this new Periodic Videos website. It's pretty nifty, hey? And here's a little sneak peek under the hood, where we've used Wix to design, make changes, get things looking just right. I have to say I've been really impressed by just how much control you have over a Wix site. Sure, they have some templates to get you started, lots of templates actually, but there's no detail you can't fine tune and tweak to get it just how you want it. No little bell or whistle you can't add to get your site doing what you want it to do. Just imagine what the periodic table might have looked like if Dmitry Mendeleev had used Wix. Now to check them out yourself, go to wix.com slash go slash periodic videos. There's the address on the screen, wix.com slash go slash periodic videos. And our thanks to Wix for supporting this episode. And we convert about 10% of that Neptunium-237 to Plutonium-238.